Good evening, good evening. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming on this crazy weather day. And I just hear we also have a water main break on 14th and 7th Avenue, just to add to the uh, typical New York confusion. <laughs> so thank you for braving yourselves through all of that. My name is Michelle Mater. I am a faculty member here at the Media Studies and Film School at the New School. And we're so excited to be able to bring you this program tonight. Um, this is part of a series also that I have called Creatively Speaking, which is a film series that's been around for 19 years. Uh, thank you, yes, some of you, some of you may know about it, have been to other programs that we've done. Um, if you have not heard of us and you're not on our mailing list and would like to be, there's a sign-up sheet in the front. Um, but tonight we're so excited. Um, you know, unfortunately the topic of this film is one that is very close to home. Uh, it continues to be very close to home. And um, what I love about this film is that it talks about a history that we have not dealt with and relates it to what's happening today, very much today. And the filmmakers are here in the audience. We're very excited to have them here, Rachel Lyon. Rachel, you're gonna come up and say a couple of words? And Pi Isis, who's the co-producer. Pi, stand up, stand up and wave. But as you know, these events are always a labor of love. And with that, I just have to thank a few people without whom I could not have done this at all. Pamela Tillis, Pam Tillis is always my right and left arms in doing these events. She's our director of public programs. Alexandra Salazar, who is the co-producer of the radio program that we have, Creatively Speaking on the Air on the Black Hole Radio Network. Liana Bailey, who is our events coordinator in media studies. And of course, my Creatively Speaking A-team, Darren Mallett, Empress Vernado, Destiny Jackson, just to name a few. But thank you everyone so much for all of your help. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, and I'd like to just mention who the sponsors are for tonight's program. The School of Media Studies, the School of Undergraduate Studies, Lioness Productions, Amnesty International USA, and Just Films, the Ford Foundation. So we have a great panel lined up for you with Rachel Lyon, the filmmaker, as well as our panelist, Stephen Hawkins, the executive director of Amnesty International USA. Stephen, you want to wave for us? Jeffrey Smith, who is a faculty member here at the Milano School. Jeffrey, are you around? Or you, he might be in the green room. Um, Linda Sarsour, who is the executive director of the Arab American Association of New York, as well as other amazing things she's doing. She's going to be joining us for the panel as well. And I just want to invite Rachel to say a couple of words. Hey, it's great to see you. Um, very, very glad that you came out, braved the weather, uh, the weather changing for sure. Um, I guess, you know, with this latest death and video of that death in South Carolina, I'm reminded that unfortunately, hate crimes in the heartland has only become more and more topical every day, every week that goes by. And we need the documentation that this film provides and other films and other media provide to shine the light on what's happening. So we'll take a look at the film and we'll talk to you afterwards and have a good conversation. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, please do stick around because it will be an interactive conversation and we look forward to it afterwards. Thank you. While we get finished setting up here, I'd just like to give a brief introduction to our panelists that are going to be taking the stage momentarily. Stephen W. Hawkins serves as the Executive Director of Amnesty International USA. Prior to joining Amnesty International USA, Steve worked as an attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where he represented African American men facing the death penalty throughout the United States Deep South. He investigated and brought litigation that saved the lives and led to the release of three black teens wrongfully convicted in Tennessee. And he continues his work in social justice focused on abolishing the death penalty. Stephen will be taking the stage momentarily. Thank you for joining us, Steve. 
Also joining us is Rachel Lyon, who you met earlier, the filmmaker. She has produced over 65 films, movies for television, feature documentaries, and limited series. Her work focuses on critical global issues, human rights, civil equality, art, and archaeology and history. She is, has also served as the Director of Special Gifts at the Jewish Federation of Cincinnati and a professor at NKU Southern Methodist U, Bentley University, and Queens College. And Linda Sarsour is also joining us. She is a working woman, racial justice and civil rights activist, every Islamophobe's worst nightmare, and mother of three. She is ambitious, outspoken, and independent, and shatters stereotypes of Muslim women while also treasuring her religious and ethnic heritage. She is the executive director of the Arab American Association of New York and senior strategist for Take on Hate, a recently launched campaign which aims to change perceptions of Arab and Muslim Americans, including refugees. And finally, last but definitely not least, Jeffrey Smith, who is an assistant professor of urban policy here at the Milano School of International Affairs Management and Urban Policy. He teaches and researches urban political economy, elect <coughs> election campaigns, power and strategy, legislative politics, and incarceration. His first book, Trading Places, analyzed modern party realignment, and his recent book, ebook, Ferguson in Black and White, explores the history of race in St. Louis. Uh, just another little side mention, Jeff was also in the Missouri Senate from 2006 to 2009. Isn't that amazing? Come on up, everyone, please join me. We're not formal. <laughs> and everyone grab a phone. Could you bring the water bottles for us there? Thank you. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, you know, this film has so much in there that we could pull apart and, and talk about. But I thought maybe we should just start with each of you saying a little bit about what your current work is about and how it relates um, to the film. So. Pick, pick a mic, feel free. <laughs> so, okay. So my current work now with, with Amnesty International is really to uh, bring human rights home, as I call it. Uh, how we uh, uh, recognize and appreciate and strive for human rights uh, and human dignity abroad but the importance of recognizing when we have human rights crises here in the United States. So that brought amnesty to Ferguson. Uh, that will have us do more work around mass incarceration and areas where I think, uh, certainly police accountability, so areas where uh, the United States falls short on its promise as a human rights defender. Really important, thank you. Linda? I'm very honored actually to be here. Um, and my work right now is um, as a Muslim American really started working on post 9-11 um, policies that have specifically targeted Muslim communities and the belief that there is a separate justice system in this country for Muslims. And my current work is really focusing and really investing my time and my life and whatever I have in what I call the black liberation movement because I believe that if we are able to ensure that black people are free and that they have the dignity and the respect that they deserve, then we're gonna be able to afford that to other communities, including Muslims. So currently my work is focused on racial justice, um, police accountability work, and I'm uh, on Monday we'll be starting a march to, called the March to Justice from New York City to Washington, D.C., 250 miles, five states, to send that message to the halls of power. Um, and that's what I'm doing right now. Awesome, amazing. Um, it's great to be here. I just want to acknowledge the co-producer of the film, Paisis Ankara, is here, and we're thrilled to have you here. We miss you. And um, we, um, I think the focus of the film, looking at, you know, hate crimes that are happening today versus what's happened in the past, the whole arming of the police, for example, um, in 1921, they had the cutting edge 
tools. The submachine guns were brand new. The planes were brand new. This was, this was cutting edge technology for 1921. And we have very similar issues occurring today. And I think the um, Good Friday shootings show that, but also in, in New York, for example, there's been an increase in hate crimes of 35% just over this past year, and especially for Muslims and Jews. And there's, you know, that is a big increase. That's not a minor detail, and that's not national, that's New York. So I just thought I would toss that into the mix. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm also very honored to be here with, uh, with such distinguished panelists. Um, I'm Jeff Smith. I teach here at the New School. Um, I'm involved kind of in a, in a variety of endeavors that uh, relate um, somewhat tangentially to some of the issues featured in the film. Um, in my role here teaching at the New School, I uh, recently oversaw a group of graduate students who traveled back to St. Louis, my hometown, uh, to work as consultants for the mayor of St. Louis. Uh, because there's been a, a significant increase in crime over the last seven or eight months since the Mike Brown killing. Uh, and yet the strain between, uh, in the relationship between police and the community um, remains uh, and is probably worse than ever. And the students looked at, um, at other cities that have experienced traumas like what St. Louis experienced uh, in Ferguson and have, are advising the, uh, the mayor's office and have just produced about a 55-page report uh, with several recommendations that the mayor uh, is planning to implement this summer. Um, and then a second area that uh, I focus on involves prison reform. I'm a board member of two organizations. Uh, one is called American um, Prison Data Systems, and its goal is to put a tablet in the hands of every inmate in the country. Uh, that would give them access to a full suite of educational and vocational training software. And then the second is called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program. And uh, it, uh, it is an organization that works to provide high-level business training using MBA students and uh, successful executives from all over the world that goes into prisons and teaches uh, prisoners how to write business plans to start businesses when they get out. Both of those sound incredible, Jeff. That's fantastic. I had no idea we were doing something like that at the New School. Very pleased to know about it. Um, so I definitely want to make this interactive. And as you can see, we have two mics set up here for people to come up and ask questions. But I just want to kick off the conversation with a couple of questions that I've been thinking about since um, Rachel and I have been trying to put this program together, which has been a minute in the making. So glad it's here. Um, so how do we, given, given the instances of what we've seen in the film, what happened in 1921, what happened in 2012, what happened yesterday in South Carolina, you know, how do we, con how can we keep this from continuing to happen? How do we keep history from repeating itself? What, what can we do that we're not doing now? What can we do differently? Where to start? Uh, one basic thing, right, is that we have no collected data in this country on, on something as basic as police shootings of, of uh, citizens. Uh, I was struck, you know, at a meeting at the White House uh, back in the fall where I asked, you know, as folks went around the table what, what was needed. I'm, I'm like, we need to have accountability. It starts with basic data collection. And the response was, well, we can't get good information from this city or that city. We, we have to be able to have that, na that national database. From there, we can see where, where, the, um, where, where, where the problems are the worst, uh, be able to focus. Uh, but without that basic data collection, I'm also struck by, you know, uh, looking around the globe where, where uh, there is collection, where, where, where there's not. I had an interesting conversation with my counterpart who's heads Amnesty Brazil the other day, the work that they've been doing around black male homicides there. 
and the efforts around data collection on a report that's about to be released there that we need to be able to do here with the same sort of map mapping. So the organizer in me comes out. Um, and, and first, there was actually an article that I just read last couple of days ago from Daily Cost that says that we, American police, have killed 111 people in the month of March, more than the UK police have killed since 1900. So just sit with that for a second. Um, so those are the kind of things that need to make us outraged. So the organizer in me says that the only way that we're going to fight back and not repeat history, this has been it. It's not even in the past, it's not history, it's 450 years of systemic racism in this country, um, is that we need to unite both uh, communities of color, um, people of conscience, we need to organize, we need to, uh, we need to start organizing from a place of self-worth and dignity. You know, we don't, we're not asking our government to do something for us that they shouldn't already be doing. We shouldn't be begging for respect and the black people begging to live, basically, is what we're talking about here. And I think we need to put this apathy to the side. We need to stop saying this is just how it's always been. Because um, for me personally, I don't, that's not the philosophy that I organize from. And I, when, I, when I've seen people organize from a place of will and a place of self-worth, I've seen people win across this country. So unless we all get together and stop saying these are isolated incidents, that's one cop over here, one cop over here, this Sisism Brothers is deep-rooted systemic racism that we need to address in this country and we need to organize. You're here. <laughs> Yeah, these are, you know, there are 18,000 police uh, units, if you will, uh, p police forces in the country. And um, of them, there are maybe 25 or 30 that can be counted on for good record keeping in terms of shootings and, and, and other things. There's, it gets less and, and more difficult as you get more suburban and rural, but it's not just rural, it's also suburban. These small shops, if you will, with five to 20 people, that's, that's kind of um, the police forces that are in the kill zone, uh, very, very much so, because they're not getting the training and they're not getting a new perspective, and that new perspective is vital. I think the other thing that the film brings out is the need for the documentation, and I think that the, the story in South Carolina is if there was no video, there would be no inquiry. There would not be a charge, it would be over, it would already be the ink dry on this policeman's word that he, his taser was gone after. And um, we could see that what, what happened wasn't what he said happened, and that, is so often the situation, it's so very difficult to prosecute policemen. So I think we have as much of a need to harness some of the media and organize within the media all these different platforms that we all have, whether it's documentary or social media, um, these are actual organizing tools and we need to use them. Mm -hmm. So Linda spoke with the passion of, of an organizer and uh, somewhat um, probably uh, less dramatically, I'm going to speak with the pragmatism of a politician, which, you know, just a few things that I think we could do. Like, number one, I mean, I think we've all seen over the last 24 hours the importance of, like, immediate documentation, i.e., like, all cops having to wear body cameras. Um, it's not... Uh, it's not a cure-all. We saw in Staten Island that even when you can watch it happen, that doesn't mean a cop's going to be prosecuted. But in both of the South Carolina cases, one from several months ago where there was the guy at the gas station mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who was shot, who's on the ground writhing around saying, but why did you shoot me? You know? and, and then this tragic case over the last uh, day or two, we see the importance of that. Second thing, you've got to take prosecutors in no one, no cop, should be prosecuted by the prosecutor in the venue where he works. It's just like, that's just so basic. They're so conflicted. Because, thank you. Because um, the prosecutor, of course, is relying on all the cops in this jurisdiction to make all his other cases. So he's, he's totally conflicted and you can't have that. Third thing is you've got to have better training for police officers so they're trained in restraint as opposed to training to be trained to shoot to kill. And related to that, it's just amazing to me that like, 
we have basically computers that we walk around with in little phones every day. You know, all the things technology can do, and we haven't figured out a way to produce like a reliable stun gun. You know, that that doesn't kill someone, and it's just crazy to me that that gov that the federal government, with the resources it ha resources it has, given this rash of, of violence, doesn't put millions of dollars into developing a weapon that can stun but not kill. Well, yes, <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I think we can find methods for things we want to create, but not for those we don't. Um, so, um, I want to talk a little bit about the intersection of all of these isms that we encountered in the film, in everyday life here in New York City. Um, race, economic justice, political representation, and the penal system. These all intersect in a way that has not been very productive <laughs> to date. What a, how do we confront these issues? What is the role and responsibility of the government in, in uh, you know, making sure that these things don't continue to um, exist or to, to impact communities of color the way they have? What do we, what do we, how do we start pulling these things apart? Easy question. <laughs> well, at, at, at the heart, right, is, again, uh, the notion that black lives don't matter, right, from an economic perspective, from a prison population that was 800,000 when Ronald Reagan was elected and 2.2 million today, right? Uh, the people I've represented on death row, um, one person in Alabama uh, the day after the trial, to keep him safe, and I'm talking about the late 70s, they transferred him to death row at that point, prior to trial. Uh, in Arkansas today, uh, the, you are assigned a number on death row, SK, whatever the, the number is. The SK stands for safekeeping. Uh, so how to tackle this is, uh, has to be massive, has to be, as Linda's point, point pointed out eloquently, you know, there, there's going to have to be a massive demonstration of uh, just outrage. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we have to get to the point where uh, politicians have to be willing to take this on courageously. I am struck by the fact that there has not been another, you know, the last time we had like a presidential commission on crime and criminal justice in this country goes back to the Johnson era. Um, and there's been nothing put together in terms of a larger national commission to look at this problem. We nip around the edges of it. That's a big question. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'll see the fruits of my labor in my time, but I will say that we need to get to a place where we understand that the system is made to work the way it works. And people say the system is broken. It's not broken at all. Um, and we have, to get, we have to change the minds and hearts of people that say, let justice take its course. And we understand that justice in this country is only for some people. So if we don't work in that frame, understanding that the system is not broken, that the system needs an overhaul, then we're actually fooling ourselves and not going on the right path. And that, not to say that that's an easy thing. That's something that requires a lot of um, kind of small steps along the way. So yes, legislative strategy is one way. Um, and even on the economic, uh, you know, one of the things I always think about, and I, I saw a study that said that, you know, when you look at the, um, consumer power of black people in this country, when you look at the consumer power of people who uh, uh, identify as Muslim in this country or women in this country, we have so much power in our hands that we just don't know how to use. We underestimate the power that we bring economically. This country is built on money and power, right? So if we can figure out how to play that money power game, 
we can move a lot faster. But for me, I organize from a place that I'm working against a system that was set up not to work for people of color in this country. And it was made to work for a certain segment of the population. And we look at what we're working against, right? We look at a Congress that is over 80% white men. And that is not what our country looks like. So how are you, we gonna expect people who don't look like us and come from different parts of the country where we don't live are going to be representing our best interests? So the fight is big, it's massive, it's huge. And for me, um, just these kind of radical acts. And I think this recent movement of Black Lives Matter, this idea of like shutting it down, not just shutting it down in the sense of like, you know, what we saw in New York City, but I'm talking about economic shutdowns. This is, gonna, what, this is what's gonna rock this country. It's how when we say, That's, this is our money, and we're putting our money in our communities, and watch and see every politician in this country, every government official will be groveling at our, at our doorsteps. But we just haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I think it is a big question, and, and I think the isms, again, kind of conflate um, in a big way in the range of, of media. And I, I kind of bring that a, a, a up again because we have kind of hate media, um, you know, starting with Fox News and going to the right of that. And people are almost encouraged to get up out of their chairs and go commit crimes. And um, there really isn't a, you know, this, uh, this left-leaning journalism that we hear so much about. Where, where is it? Where is it? I, I would like to see some of this, you know? And so I, I think that what happens is we forget that 90% of the media in this country is owned by 10 companies, 10 companies, and that the 10% that isn't owned is on the internet. Does that give us a clue about where the free, quote unquote, free market is? It does. And we have a, an opportunity to take, I guess, to take the statements and the documentation of what's going on in our country to heart by taking it to task in front of the media. So one of the things that Linda said was, uh, sorry to keep, I'm not, I'm not like going after you, you know. But, but, but you said like why, you know, the, the question that a lot of people ask is why don't they let justice work or why don't they let, why don't they let justice run its course and, and that reminded me it was so similar to what I heard I went back to Ferguson um, several times immediately uh, like last fall I interviewed about 75 people for for my ebook and uh, the most common refrain I heard from white people was because that was pre-verdict and the most common refrain I heard was why can't people wait and just let the process play out before they get so angry. You know, to which I'd always reply, because the process has never played out or worked for them, and they have no faith. I didn't talk to a single, you know, probably out of 40 black people I interviewed, my last question was always like, what do you think is gonna happen? What do you think the verdict will be? And of course, 40 out of 40 said, they'll never indict them. Um, they knew. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, it's, uh, you know, we, we definitely, you know, we need a transformation. You know, you, you asked about penal reform, and I have, I have some thoughts on that. I'll try to hold them to 45 seconds here. But one thing that Michelle didn't say when she introduced me was that I spent 2010 in federal prison. And, you know, I'm sitting here now, and I'm on this stage, and I have a nice job here as a professor. Uh, everybody pretty much that I was locked up with that I stay in touch with is not in that position. I'm white. Uh, I have a PhD from a great university. I had great family and community support when I came out. And we have a recidivism rate in this country which drives that mass incarceration statistic that Stephen noted. Uh, the recidivism rate of you know, two thirds uh, being rearrested in the first three years is what drives that. And as long as we have a system that sets up people to fail by having a total lack of rehabilitation in the system, uh, and, and not preparing people for reentry at all, it only surprises me that the recidivism rate is as low as it is. You're right, absolutely. 
Please join us at the microphone. Come on up to the mic if you have questions. Um, and I'm, as you do that, I'm just going to throw one more question or, or comment, look for a comment. Uh, Charles Ogletree in the film said that the t 1921 Tulsa riots were not riots, that they were ethnic cleansing. And I thought that was very telling because we never refer to any time black people get killed as a Holocaust, as an ethnic cleansing. And that I thought was quite brave of him to do so. Um, does anyone know if anyone else ever referred to those riots in that way? Well, um, Charles Ogletree uh, worked for uh, almost a dozen years on trying to get reparations for the survivors and their families. Unsuccessfully, by the way. It didn't work in Tulsa, it didn't work in Oklahoma, it didn't, at the Supreme Court refused to hear them and the Congress refused to enact any law to help them. And so it was another time when, uh, when there was no, um, no reparation at all, even though these survivors were here and able and willing to say what happened to them. So I think that what Charles Ogletree and others have said is that this was a massacre it was on such a scale. Nearly 300 people were killed in one night. And so it, in a way, breaks away from even the other race riots that were going on post-World War I, of which there were many in the belt of the South and even in the North. Um, those riots were always considered riots, and we used to call race riots in this country white mobs going after black and brown, but usually black communities, um, that's what race riots were until the 1960s. Uh, what, what struck me about uh, the lack of any national accountability is then how we can better use human rights tribunals uh, to, to, to press for, for, for our claims. Um, and uh, I'm struck by how recently uh, uh, several forums, the, um, uh, the committee that looks at the convention around race discrimination, commenting on, on the criminal justice system in, in the United States. We have to remember that 25 years after the Tulsa riots, W.E.B. Du Bois and Walter White were, were at the very formation of the United Nations trying to get this new world body to pay to to take, uh, to take up the issue of lynching and the destruction of black lives and property in the United States. Great book to read is um, Eyes Off the Prize by Carol Anderson and the whole way that Eleanor Roosevelt and others actually stopped that from happening. And, and then it sort of set us on a trajectory where human rights just became not part of our, our, uh, the tools in our toolbox. But, but I would love to think about how you take what happened with the Tulsa race riots and bring it, um, bring, bring it into the same realm of discussion as the Armenian genocide and other atrocities that have happened. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'd like to start off by saying, I believe all life matters. And I'm gonna be very honest with everyone here because they say, let's have an honest discussion. I did some research and what happened yesterday was inexcusable. No one could, it was terrible. It was lucky we had a video to see that. No one could justify that. When I saw what happened in Staten Island, I was amazed. How could I? police officer not be convicted. But one thing I want to address to everyone in this panel, because when I saw this documentary, I would think, gee, whites are always the perpetrators, Afro-Americans are always the victims. But statistically speaking, now how are you going to address this? If you look at it statistically, black on white crime is four times likely than white on black crime. That shows up, you know, but it, I'm going to be honest with you, the media doesn't make mention of it. When it's a black doing something to whites, you don't hear much about it. Or they don't identify the race of either, either party. Let's no, be honest. I, I think you're a little, you got the numbers reversed a little bit. Okay, I can think you so. Prove this I think so. I'm just saying. We, we I did have, we did, we did have, we had the statistics right. in the okay. film. Would you say, and then I'm, because what happened yesterday was terrible, what happened in 1921 was terrible, but do you also have to admit that it could be the, the, other, the converse as well? No. You don't think it's black? <laughs> no. Well, I then do you're not. Wrong. You're not facing reality. No, I don't think Four so. Four times as much black on white than white on Sir, black. Sir, I think you've got your numbers a little skewed. Yes, we should. 
Does anybody agree with this gentleman no. up here? Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Lyon, um, with all due respect for admiring the, your feelings and sensitivities in your film, and I know you don't have Alex Gibney's budget or Michael Moore's outrage or humor, have you ever thought that in making a film like this, the talking heads and a historic overview is maybe too kind a treatment where there are people in Tulsa who hate and have fears that they're, and insecurities that if you had more time to investigate, you might have been able to get in this film. Uh, the kind of documentary that makes me angry when I see it, a Molotov cocktail of a film that I go to bed hitting my pillow as opposed to the politeness of what you've presented here too. I guess I'm not faulting you, that's your sensibility. But why can't this issue produce somebody who really wants to get people angry and do something and go to the streets and do something? You, Miss, Miss Sasso, you have that kind of sensibility. I think you know what I mean. Why don't you make a movie? Don't give any ideas. <laughs> don't, don't, I, I don't even want to show you. I mean, I think this is just a snippet um, and what I, what I got from the film, um, and when I was watching Walter Scott get shot yesterday, is I want people to understand that what you watch up there is just now in a different form, and it's in police killings, which is the new 2015 version of lynching in this country. And I want people to understand that this, we, this is not, we're not comparing, this is not about comparing numbers, we're talking about real people who are talking to their children who might not come home tonight, and that's what people need to understand. In the Muslim community, we are only less than 2% of the population. We have uh, prisons in Indiana with maximum security prisons where people don't have access to their families being convicted on secret evidence. We don't even know why they're being convicted, right? And we are only less than 1% of the population, and we are 85% of the population of these Indiana and some in New Orleans, what they call communications management units. People have to understand what's behind the veil, what's behind the curtain. And what we need is outrage. This is what you do, you outrage people. And if this doesn't make you outrage, if what's happening in this country doesn't make you outrage, then we have to question our own humanity as people, as individuals. Thank you. We're bouncing back and forth. Hi, um, I just want to first say that it's such a pleasure to listen to you all speak and to learn from your experience and I hope that I can do half as much of the things that each of you individually have done. Um, so my question specifically is, uh, you had mentioned that it's the power and money that, that runs this country and um, where we see a lot of racism is in the prison system and a lot of that has been privatized and a lot of the criminal justice system has been privatized and, and a lot in America just has been privatized. So um, whereas we're going up against governments before that were racist and racist police, now we're going up against corporations that are racist, um, that have more money, that have more power, that have lobbyists that, that go after the congressmen. So in the, the changing tide in the last 30 years with the privatization of of prisons and, and criminal justice, um, how do we address that as activists and in resolving um, racism in the context of privatization? Thank you. Thank you. So I have a couple of thoughts, and they may not be popular in this room, um, or you may not agree with them, but I don't think, um, I've been in, in a lot of prisons, one of them involuntarily, and uh, I will say that like the publicly run prison um, was probably, the publicly run federal prison was probably the worst one that I've seen. The most humane one I'd seen, I've seen is w this one in Texas, this town of Cleveland, Texas, where all the inmates uh, are doing 40 hours a week of a business school curriculum, and that's a privatized prison. I totally hear what you're saying. There's, there's tons of vendors making tons of money on the system. There are clearly examples, especially like phone service, right? Because you gotta pay, in my prison, it was like about $3 a minute to make a phone call, right? It's, it's just, it is rapacious. And they're actually moving in a lot of prisons towards video visits where you can't even have a human visit, but you have to pay money to do a video visit, even if your family comes all the way there. They don't let you actually see them. So I'm not saying that privatization isn't a problem at all. I'm only saying that the incentives are just as bad on the public side. Public 
correctional officers unions are, you know, they want to keep their jobs just as much as anybody else. Excuse the language, but there was, there was one guard where I was, and you know what he said to every single person who left? He'd say, you'll be back, shitbird. Guys like you are how I keep my job. Right? And so the incentives are in place, public or private. You know, they're, they're in place either way. And if you look at like the political juice, to get back to kind of some of the things you were talking about, the political juice behind some of the most draconian criminal justice policy initiatives like California's three strikes are out that has imprisoned people for life because their third crime was stealing a candy bar. The political juice behind that came from the California Correctional Officers Union, you know, public sector work employees. So definitely privatization is a problem, but it's not, I, I think the same terrible incentives are there in the public sector side as well. But thanks very much for that question. Yeah. And just to reframe that a little bit, it not focusing on the privatization, but it's, it is the prison industrial complex. There are people making money both on the public and the private sector, so, that, so we need to talk about that, so follow the money. The second thing is just looking at internationally, when we talk about militarization, right, and we talk about the, you know, what, the, the money and the resources that our country spends, not only on devaluing life here in this country, but devaluing people of color in other, in other parts of the world, right, on our taxpayer dollars, while we continue to imprison people in this country, while we continue to shut down schools in some of the most low-income communities uh, in this country, and while we continue to cut Medicare and Social Security and all the things that we deserve as American citizens, and we continue to say we don't have money for this, we don't have money for that, but we're spending trillions and trillions of dollars in aid to uh, military aid to other countries, um, and also in our own wars, and many, if not all wars, to me are unjust in places across the world. So what I'm saying is we need to have a bigger converse conversation about where our taxpayer dollars go, who do they benefit, who's benefiting from those, um, and who gets lost along the way. So the anti-war movement is a big part of the conversation on militarization here, uh, in our um, local communities like we saw in Ferguson and, New and, and the NYPD, if you can just think about the type of resources they have here in, in military and heavy artillery, we heard that from our commissioner, and then looking at the same uh, militarization abroad that we're um, engaging in. So it's a bigger conversation for me about war and warmongering and money in prisons, but also in military um, intervention, action or whatever you want to call it. Mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Um Thank you for making a movie. I mean, a lot of things go through my head. First thing I want to say is that um, it's a great movie. It made me think. February 26, 7, 1869, the North made a pact with the South to criminalize black people and brown people because we were now free, so they, need, they still needed slave labor. That mentality still exists in America today. So everybody think it's new, it's been here. It is the system. It's not part of the system. It is the system. The only place you can go in America and lose your freedom completely is prison. You lose your right to vote. You, you, no longer, you become a slave. It says it in the Constitution. <clears throat> the problem I see that you showed, but you didn't talk about, but you showed it very powerfully, it is obvious that it was a fiduciary responsibility of the city of Oklahoma to repay the people that they offended. They didn't. So the people who attacked, looted, robbed, they took the money out of the bank. You know they did that. They went and built their community up. Now, 94 years, 94 years later, you see a very strong white community and a black community that was very powerful. Now it's still in shambles. Until you go after the money, there will never be justice. The money is the justice in America. It's not the race. Here, it's here. the money. You know, we're not going out the money, then Amnesty International, Amnesty International. Until you get the lawyers, the police officers, this is the district attorney, all of them were complicit in sending these black men and black women and brown men and white women, poor people to jail, they had to break the law. So they must now do the time that the person did that you got free. Another, until you do that, it's just a, a clown court. So what, the man got freed after 39 years. He's 39 years a slave. He lost his life, he lost his family, he lost everything. And the people who put him there get to walk around and still live in Beverly Hills wherever they live in. I'm gonna leave it there because you know, I can go on and on. <laughs> Thank you. Also, before I leave, for the guy who said this, the, st the statistics show, because I am the host of Unlawful Captives, Black Hole Radio, and Thank the you. owner of Black Hole Radio, the statistics show that black on black crime 
Brown on black, brown crime <clears throat> is less than white on white crime because we commit crimes where we live at. But unlike any other people, black people stay amongst black people, brown people stay amongst brown people and hurt each other, but white people like to come across the border. This is your unique DNA. You love to come to black and brown communities and wreak havoc. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it like that. Hi, uh, my name is Marquis Smalls, and I want to first say thank you for making the film. It was really um, empowering to watch and see how you tie both instances to remind us that this is not changing. And then I also want to thank the rest of the panel for all your insight. You, know, you guys are really... Um, sparked some real inspiration in me as well. Um, my question is for Ms. Lyon. Um, as I'm watching the film, and I see you did interviews with some of the survivors, um, the one thing that I felt I was missing, though, was their stories around what happened afterwards. Like, what, you know, what are the stories of how they, you know, not just that they did survive, but how did they survive? And what actually happened to the town in the time period directly following that night. You know, there was like never a mention of like what actually happened on June 2nd or June 3rd or, you know, what types of things were going on. So I was just curious to see if in your research you um, could share any of that with us. Well, it's a very interesting question. The, the city of Tulsa was under um, military rule for about a week and then slowly, the um, uh, African-American community was taken away from the kind of uh, almost, you know, almost a Holocaust center where they were, um, you know, uh, in, in the fairground being kept 10,000 people, you know, just you know, it, and, and it, they built tents and they put up a tent community for a couple of years. John Hope Franklin and his father lived in a tent. His father was a lawyer and he was, of, of course, an, a, you know, an incredible historian. And they lived in tents for a couple of years while things began to be put back together. Um, it was the will of the white community really hoped to take that land that was so nicely near downtown and use it for their own purposes. And John Hope Franklin and his father fought against that for decades, literally, and foiled that plot. So the area is still a black um, African-American area um, only because the legal battle was fought and fought really hard. Amazing. That's quite a story. Yeah, it's a story into, into itself. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, eventually we had to take some things out of the film. But thank you for the question. Could go in the webisodes. Jeff, you'd want to add to something to that? I was just going to first thank you for, for, for that history and, and for the great question. And, and incidentally, I uncovered in my research in Ferguson that was almost precisely, the minus the, minus the, the riot in, in the same way, but it was desirable land in the way of development in a corridor of the city that had great land value. Blacks uh, just t displaced, um, wealth taken, uh, no intergenerational wealth able to be preserved in the community, and then s sort of forced into a, a little spot in Southeast Ferguson, which is you know where Michael Brown's family lived. Wow. Wow. I, I, I wanted to bring up, I'm glad you said things, I wanted to bring up the intergenerational wealth, what that, how that was taken away from the people in Tulsa and in, in Missouri. Yes, Elaine. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, excuse me, I have allergies, uh, for presenting the film and Michelle for putting together such an insightful group. Uh, I have a two-part question for you, Rachel. Could you, first of all, has, it, has the film been shown in Tulsa? And what has been the response there? since? since it is uh, very, uh, very specifically focused on Tulsa. Uh, what has been the, the outgrowth of that? Uh, are people referencing the film in terms of their organizing in any way? 
just how has the film had an afterlife after its presentation? And that ties into the second part of my question, which is, it says here in the information that it is both a film and a community outreach project. So could you please, please define for us what you mean by community outreach? What role it had in the actual um, production process? And just how you, how you see community outreach just as, just as part of your work. Thank you. Sure. Um, Tulsa greeted the film with open arms. We had an, an incredible panel uh, initially there. We will be going back to Tulsa. We've been invited back on May 26th. So we will be there for uh, 2095 is, of course, a major anniversary of this race riot and Holocaust, if you will. Um, so we will be there for it. Um, we really had a great cooperation from uh, the local police there who had an, a view of engagement with the African-American community as opposed to enragement with the African-American community. And I think the film talks about there having been progress in Tulsa. And so I think there are some very positive things that are, are, are brought out. Um, I'm working with Amnesty International actually on the community outreach project and we are going community to community. We're just talking earlier today about seven or eight additional uh, screenings that we're going to have and we are doing these dialogues which is a major part or a um, a major part of the community engagement campaign so thank you for the question yes um firstly thank you so much for creating this film um, Ms. lyon uh, this question is uh, directed to Ms. arsour um, as a queer API person, I, I just want to say that I really appreciate how you talked about how you need, wanted to uplift black liberation as you work along with your own people's um, struggles and oppression. Aside from, or along with addressing anti-black racism within my own community, a lot, you know, aside from doing solidarity actions with the black community, uplifting those voices, what can we do to dismantle white supremacy and colonization within our own communities and kind of like outwards, so. Another easy question. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for that question. I think um, even within talking about um, uplifting, you know, black people and black lives, we talk about LGBTQ black lives, which is a whole other situation, and transgender women of color who have been disproportionately impacted by police violence. I mean, I can go on forever. Um, I think you're already, just the, just the fact that you even asked this question already tells me that you're already doing what you need to do. The idea here is that we need to stand up, we gotta get off the sidelines, right? We gotta stand up to our own people, and even when we talk about dismantling white supremacy, we need white people to help us dismantle white supremacy. Like, it's not, the, it's not my job as a person who has white skin but is not white and does not benefit from white privilege, nor do you, nor do black people, nor do Latinos and others, it is not our job on our own to dismantle white supremacy. So I see a lot of people in the audience here and in the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen many white allies who have really come to be supportive. Um, and I think our job and my job within the Muslim community where we also uh, have issues with anti-black racism, although a third of the Muslim community is African American. So I'm not telling you I come from a perfect community, it's, it's far from perfect, but when people see us stand in our own community, it encourages others. And for me personally, I'm very invested in this next generation of kind of pop culture, young people who are able to watch these videos, are connected to the movement, are on the college campuses, and I'm seeing progress. So I want you to know that you're just doing what you need to do, and I'm just happy to have you here, and I'm happy you asked that question, because I already know that you're doing what you need to do. Yes. Hello, I have uh, two questions that I don't think are very related, but who knows? <laughs> so <clears throat> the first one is, um, I was thinking about, you know, there are um, survivors, black survivors that speak and that are seen in the movie. And I was thinking there must also be white survivors, people that shot and people that have children and grandchildren that shot. You know, I'm German and this is actually the common <laughs> thing in my two questions I just realized. And I once did a, a research that was uh, done from our 
uh, high school research about the Hitler Youth in our town. And I spoke and I learned that the grandparents of my friends, and in my case not mine, but might as well have been mine, were in the Hitler Youth and they did things and that made it all, brought, really brought it home, you know. So I think in Tulsa there must be grandchildren and children who know that their grandfather went out that night and shot. Mm -hmm. And it's not about... Um, making them feel guilty for what their grandfather did, obviously, me being German, <laughs> that's obvious not the case. But to really bring, you have to bring that together. You know, that has to be brought together if you want to have a conversation about this, the way it was brought together in South Africa in some ways, because I don't think otherwise it's possible. Because it is haunting people too. And the ones that are not haunted, you know, are the ones we don't need to talk to, I think. And the ones that are not haunted, and that's the second question that I have is um, in regards to reparations again. Like me being German, you know, obviously Germany did pay a lot of reparations and um, rightfully so in my opinion. And I wonder why in this country, and I know that's a big question, that has never been, we could never address that. I think if that has, cannot be addressed, we don't even need to talk. It's like from the beginning on, from from the very first moment, this is really the question that that's the elephant in the room, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And, uh, and uh, you know, how it is done, I don't know, but if there's a will, there's, there's a way. So. Thank you. I think you've got a couple of really good questions. Um, I, what's interesting in Tulsa is that the children, if you will, the children of the rioters, grandchildren of the rioters, are very hidden away. There was a mob, it was in a, in a group, hiding in plain sight in a group, and the individuals, not one person was ever prosecuted, not one person ever spent a night in jail for what happened. And they tended to lie and hide what they did from their children and grandchildren. So there are not a lot of stories out there about the white survivors. It's a very interesting question and something that we actually pursued unsuccessfully in, in terms of uh, trying to find the families of and things like that, except for a couple of star players, like there was a family called the Brady family who, who's the grandfather of that family was very involved in the Ku Klux Klan, which was almost assuredly involved in the riot, and there's a street named after him, there's been a big protest about it, so there's like one or two big exceptions to, to the rule. I think why there haven't been reparations in this country is a bigger question, I'd love to actually pop that toward you, Steve, because the, the reparations almost solely have happened with the Japanese survivors of the concentration camps. If you look at what's happened for Native Americans and African Americans, there's been very little. I remember being at the uh, UN conference on racism over 10 years ago now, and in, in, in Durban, and some of you in the room were maybe, maybe there as well, and uh, the effort that was put into really presenting the question of reparations uh, with groups from across the uh, country. So the U.S. government stands in alliance with all the former colonial powers, uh, England, Portugal. <laughs> they all came together <clears throat> to squash it. And uh, it, was, it was just uh, uh, quite, a, quite a shock. Uh, but we cannot give up on that claim. I mean, Professor Ogletree's done quite a bit in that area as, as, as well. Uh, it uh, must be pressed. The gentleman earlier talked about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the economics. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that Mr. Hinton, the man in Alabama who got out from 30 years on death row, yes. uh, he will now fight for pennies from the Alabama le le legislature. If he got hit by a bus in Montgomery, he would get more money. Um, and that is uh, tragic, and, and we have to find a way to correct that. Okay. I just want to be a little spicy because I, it's nine. It's it gets like I, I get like this at night. Excuse me. 
I'm inviting you to panels during the day. I'm a little bit quieter. No, no, no. We like you like this. Um, I mean, the question about like the white survivors and maybe this was pursued, but this is my thing. It's like, do I need to have some descendants of slave masters to tell me that slavery was bad and to tell a story of the impact of slavery? Like, is that not enough for survivors to be able, the survivors of the riots to tell us the impact that it's had to see those pictures? I don't know for me personally if that would have added anything to the documentary or if there has to always be this other side of the story. Um, I don't know. And I feel like when we look at the media, which is I think part of this discussion, is that we really never have another side of the story. Oftentimes the black folks and brown folks are dead so they can't really defend themselves. Then the media starts telling you about something they did when they were 12. Um, and, even, and even sometimes the media starts making up their own rationalization. And one of the reasons, you know, I, you know I'm actually going to be in Chapel Hill on Friday and, and, and um, Saturday. And I was the media spokesperson for the Chapel Hill families whose three children were executed by a white man who was a very uh, extremist anti-theist. Um, and people wanted us to believe that these beautiful children were killed because there was a parking dispute. As if like he couldn't kill anyone else in their apartment complex but these three young Muslim kids. So I think we need to understand that there, there doesn't always have to be another side of the story so the perpetrator has the same platform as the, the victim when oftentimes our victims are not alive to tell you their side of the story. So I'm very happy with listening to survivors and believing that the impact was great and that it continues without having some grandchild of a white person tell me whether they, what they feel about it. I don't know, that's just my opinion. Jeff. If, if I could just touch briefly on, on media representations with respect to the, what happened in Ferguson. Um, I don't know if any of you guys were on the ground at all, but, um, yes, but, but one of the things, and, and see if you agree with me here, one of the things that I found notable it was that at night, you know, the couple nights that it did get bad, number one, that was about three nights out of every single night from August 9th till today, people have been out there, right? So there were a few nights that it got bad. And the few nights that it got bad, I'd say, you know, there were 25, 30 people, you know, who were, who were engaged in that and probably, you know, several hundred who were not. So like 2% of the people out there. But the media, of course, you know, if there's somebody throwing a brick in a, you know, in a, in a unit, in a um, store, then the media's all over that. And I thought about it because I realized that I was as, compl as sort of complicit in the problem as anybody else because when I'd come back here to New York, I'd be up at night at three in the morning watching the nights that it was worst. And so I was feeding the beast, right? Because the media is just trying to go after eyeballs. And they knew what would sell. They knew what people were going to watch. Um, but it, it really was just such... The, the, the stark juxtaposition of what was actually happening versus what was projected onto screens across the world was, was really amazing. Or the pumpkin riots, or when Kentucky lost, like, what, two days? Like, oh, when yes. we started, we were oh, talking yes. about riots in this country and burning of cars and <laughs> chaos in the streets. But anyway. Well, I think, you know, this conversation is amazing. I really appreciate all of you being here and share with it. Thank you, Rachel, for this piece of media that tells the truth. <laughs> and I think if there's one... There's one takeaway that, that we can, you know, garner from this conversation is that, you know, there are coalitions in this room that need to be built. And from that point to moving forward in a, in a, a focused, meaningful way, I think we can really make an impact. Um, I think we have, we have the talent up here to make it happen, don't we? Um, and I uh, just want to thank everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one more question. I'm sorry. Hello. Hi. Am I too tall? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Hi, um, I'm from South Africa, Cape Town. Um, I've only been in New York probably almost four years. Um, and uh, it's re being here, it's a completely culture shock for me. I mean, I grew up going to school with every type of race. And, it ju you know, I was four when apartheid ended, so I don't understand apartheid at all. Like, my, I, thinking back, I'm like going to school and I would get home and I'd be like, hey mom, this is my new friend. And she'd be like, what, this is your friend? And I never understood like why teachers and like the older generation was so like, is so opposed to like getting to know another human being 
because they are like just because they are different you know and so I come here and I like think oh racism is so much better here because you know it, they've had like 40 more years to like sort out the issues and like everything but it I think and I'm like I'm looking for an apartment where can I live and I'm like my friends are like don't stay in this area don't stay in this area because this is dangerous this is dangerous but this is my question like how if we if we keep the areas to a specific gender, like, isn't that also, like, really part of the problem? Because if I'm not able to go live, like, somewhere where technically, like, I wouldn't live, like, yes, nowadays there's more younger, different culture people living in Harlem, living in bed living in all these areas, but, I mean, shouldn't that be more of, like, a welcoming thing? Like, I get that, like, you know, everyone has different cultures and, like, like, Black people, for for example, like they have the whole culture. White people have the whole culture. Like it's not offensive in South Africa to call a brown person colored. And I'm like, why is it offensive here? You know? Mm -hmm. And it's like no. you know, you're like you're brown or colored or you're black or you're white. Like what's the difference? But it's like yes, we're not blind, but like we should be more acceptable and welcoming to different people in our own culture. Yes, like this is maybe your area and like you've been here for a very long time, but like how do we change the, what do you, well, I don't know how to explain so, correctly. So in this country, we got it. so in this country <laughs> okay. there's a definition for what you're talking about, right? And it's called gentrification. Yeah. So you're welcome to come and live in a predominantly black community or a Latino community. You're more than welcome. We are in this country are free to live wherever we want to live. But you must respect the community that is in that neighborhood. And the problem that we have sometimes is that when communities are what we call gentrified, right? Oftentimes that means young, white, many most often privileged come into a community, then those people get pushed out because rents are higher, businesses are raising prices. There's a lot of factors that go into that. So it has nothing to do with you as an individual. But also New York City, is the most diverse city in the world, but probably the most segregated. And we saw a report that our schools are the most segregated in the country. So you're right, on an individual level, you're beautiful, you sound intelligent and smart, and I love you. But if you're gonna to come to my community in Bay Ridge, which is a predominantly Arab community, I want you to respect the people in my community, the, the, the culture in my community, because you're coming to a community that already has been there, exists. So the idea is not to erase the exist, the, the the, the existence of a community that are, already lives there, which unfortunately is happening across this country, and it's very sad. Like right now, people are trying to move people to Detroit. Like Detroit was the blackest city in America, and then there's a lot of. So we just have to understand that we just have to respect the people that we're going to live with in the communities, and that's really what it's about. And you'd probably be safer living in Bushwick than anywhere else in the city. You'd be just fine. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I completely agree with that, and like I'm uh, 100. I wanted to add that, but I didn't get there. Um, it's I understand completely that people have different cultures, and I think the main thing is that people should respect each other, and it's not to take away from anything exactly. or not to take away from anyone's culture or religion or whatever it is. Like it's be or do whatever you like, essentially believe in as a human, but have other respect other people on the same level and I think if that gets taught into schools yeah. and in pol police academies and things just yeah. general respect yeah. of another human and isn't that what most religions teach as well to love why is our hate overriding our love Sorry. thank you beautiful okay our very very last question come 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 quick 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 <laughs> okay quick, quick. I'm just curious that the the gentleman who cited the, um, the violence statistics. Closer to the mic. With your deep knowledge, um, how would you respond to somebody like that? I'm, I'm just curious. It's, it's, inc it's just incorrect. Correct. Yeah. It's but just straight you know, up I mean, wrong. Beyond, beyond that, I mean, because I think he looked up like the FBI statistics it's, and... It's ignorance. A... It's ignorance. It's people not looking be beneath the surface. It's people believing everything they hear on Fox News. It's, you know, I mean, it's all the things that we've been talking about up here. I mean, these are the, these is, this is what we're up against. Right. I mean, it's having a conversation. I didn't want to dismiss him, but his information was inaccurate. Yeah. And there, you sometimes hear people that come with an agenda. They have one thing, they right. dismissed everything that was just happening on the screen right, right. here. They're dismissing people's voices and they're coming with to say, but what about black on white crime? 
I mean, I, 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 I want to have those discussions, but I don't want to have it with people that want to go there first yes. and don't want to have a, 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 an ordinary discussion. No, I completely agree. So when he asked that question, I looked it up, and the FBI statistics do show that. That's where he got his information from. So that's, that was kind of my question. <laughs> yeah, we, it's, back to, it's back to Linda's response. It's back to, <laughs> it's back to Linda's, sister, Linda's comment that the system is not broken. The system is purposely and, designed. And also just want people to understand that any reporting that happens, right, including an NY, first of all, an NYPD, which is the largest police force in this country, if it wasn't for a lawsuit against the New York Police Department, we would have never gotten the stop and frisk, mm -hmm. yes. right? And how, do we, how, does the, how does the NYPD do data reporting based on their own perception? Right. So if they stop me in the street, they'll be like, Jeff home girl's said. white, right? right? But I'm not white. That's not my race. So it's based on there. They find a guy, they can, a cop could put black. So it's not based on actual, your, your, you know, your license, you know, driver's license. It's based on whatever discretion the police officer has. So the fact that, that requires a community that, that trust that the system is doing what they need to do. And me personally, like, that's just not me. And it's not a lot of communities of color in this country. Jeff, I'll give you the last word. Right. Okay. Well, that's a lot of responsibility. But I was going <laughs> to say that I, I don't think anyone on the panel or anyone in the auditorium would say that there's, there's no black on white crime. Oh, no. I think people acknowledge that, that it exists. I also think that like tonight was more about crime that exists because of race. Right, of course. Crime where people are singled out because of who they are, whether it's their sex or their ethnicity or their race or whatever. And so I think that was kind of, you know, the, the context of, of the evening. And so while I think it's, it's a worthwhile conversation to have uh, and probably a necessary one to have, it just, probably the general feeling on the panel was it wasn't the place or time to have it? I, I agree with that, and I, that's what I thought. But I, I felt that that was, um, by dismissing him and not having that conversation, was a bit of a squandered opportunity in terms of having that dialogue and that conversation. Okay, well, I don't think he was the person to have it right. with. I really don't. I, no, Sorry, I, that was my prerogative as moderator. Right. I took it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think yeah. he was the person to have that dialogue with, but all of you were, and we really appreciate the fact that you were here and part of this dialogue, and thank you again for our, to our panelists for being here and being part of this. Thank you.